Okay, everyone, I have on Dr. Stacy Whitman, and I'm really excited to chat with her. You guys all know that I'm a crazy oral health nut, um, and she is on a mission to create a cavity-free world. Uh, she founded No Po, is it No Po Kids? Do you pronounce it No Po? It stands for North Portland, so it's a okay. region. It's a region of Portland, yeah. Okay, how do you say it, though? No, no Po. Okay, okay. No uh -huh. Po Kids Dentistry in North Portland. Um, and she takes a whole body holistic and functional approach with her patients. Um, and I've been following her on Instagram for a while. So I was super, super stoked when she agreed to come on. I'm in that stage of my life. I have a, uh, a three and a half year old and I have a two year old and now a four month old. Oh, um, so dentistry is a part of our life and yes. parenting now. <laughs> so, um, and it's more than just being like dental checkups, right? There's so much more we can do for our kids oral health. So I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. So thank you so much for coming on. I'm honored to be here. I love talking about all of these things and um, congratulations on such a beautiful family. I hope some of these tips that we talk about today can translate and make your, your life easier too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Um, <laughs> So I just kind of want to dive into, just start with like some of the general information about like, when do we start taking our kids to the dentist, um, toothpaste for kids? I mean, when do we start flossing? Are yeah. there like red flags to look for in a dentist office? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. cause I even know for me, I'll just give a, a quick synopsis here. So my three and a half year old has been to the dentist a few times. And, um, because I'm super proactive, um, when she was a baby, she had ties released. I did some follow-up last year just to get things assessed. She does have still kind of a high palate, like a little bit of a receding jaw. So they were like, we can refer her to a pediatric orthodontist to maybe get some early expansion, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She screamed the entire, like would not do anything. And so of course they're not going to be like, okay, let's strap her down and force her mouth open. They're like, okay, let's try again in six months. Um, give it some time, blah, blah, blah. Um, but like, since then I've been like trying to find, cause she needs a cleaning done. The last time I took her to my regular dentist, he doesn't do pediatrics. She screamed the whole time. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to look for in a dentist now <laughs> to like mm -hmm. Try yeah. to get her to sit for a cleaning and what sure. to do. So, um, yeah, all of that that I just threw at you. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love it all. Well, let's start with when I like to see patients first. Um, so the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommend to bring your kids in by the age of one. Um. I like to see babies because I do look for tethered oral tissues and talk about oral motor function and things of that nature too. So the, you know, it says by the age of one or around the, the time the first tooth erupts. So that could be around six, seven, eight months old. Now, a lot of parents go, what? That's insane. Like, why would I bring my kids in this early? This is about prevention. This is about root cause medicine. So we want to educate. It's not as much about looking in your child's mouth. Yes, we do that. And if we catch things early, we can intervene. And whether that's a growth and development issue, an airway issue, or maybe there's early decay happening, because as soon as a tooth erupts, it can get a cavity, just so everyone knows that. Um, but it's really about education, because where are you getting these things from? You're not getting them from your OBGYN. Pediatricians, with all due respect, they know almost nothing about oral health, growth and development, airway health. They have so many other things on their plate. This really is the dental field. Um, so where are you going to get that information unless you're just like obsessing over Instagram, right? Which I don't right. want you doing that either. So a lot of it's for educating the, the parent, but also we get we do get the kids used to the dental environment early so that hopefully they're not the three and a half or four year old that's really nervous coming into the dentist. Now, a lot of this is personality driven. And we have a lot of kids that, they, I mean, we have five and six year olds that still have a hard time. We have 12 year olds that still have a hard time at the dentist. There are adults that still have a hard time at the dentist. But we do know um, early exposure um, and desensitization really does help. So what you want to look for in a dentist, I mean, I really encourage you to, for everyone to work with a pediatric dentist. 
it's sort of like just we wouldn't bring our kids to our our primary care physician. We would only see a pediatric you know, physician. It's the same with dentistry. I was a general dentist and adult dentist for years and years. And I can tell you the curriculums, they do not teach very much about pediatrics. Um, children are not little adults, neither are their teeth. Their teeth are different. They're innervated differently. They're mineralized differently. Their nerves go into the teeth differently. They grow differently. Um, there's just a lot that goes into it. We, they also, there's the behavioral management. There's also just being aware of childhood diseases, genetic predispositions, things of that nature, um, nutritional deficiencies, eczema, asthma, a lot of these things that happen in childhood that we don't have the education for in a general dentist setting. So of course I would prefer like a holistic or functional integrative biological pediatric dentist, but they're very few and far between. So even just a pediatric dentist would be my, recomm my recommendation. And I would try to get them in as soon as possible. So then you said, I believe, when do we start brushing? How do we do this? So as I mentioned, the moment a tooth erupts, it can get a cavity. Um, now we do notice cavities generally don't form until food has been introduced. So all these mamas out there who are getting shamed about their breast milk causing cavities, it is not your breast milk, I will die on this hill. The research has proven time and time again, it is not the breast milk that is cariogenic or cavity causing. It's only after we've introduced foods. And generally that means ultra processed fermentable carbohydrate type foods. So the, the melty uh, like Cheerio kind of snacks, the rice crackers and the chips and the granola bars and the goldfish crackers and the fruit snacks and the gummy vitamins and things of that nature that that um can really create a negative environment in the mouth because our pathogenic bacteria feed only on fermentable carbohydrates so if you're introducing these foods hygiene's tricky because you have a one-year-old so you're not brushing optimally but these food remnants are on the teeth now there's a biofilm which is the plaque has built up and it sits there day after day after day, what the biofilm does, it releases acid. And it's the acid that leaches minerals out of the teeth and at some point creates a hole. Um, and so that's why I like to see kids early as well, because if this process has started, this process of demineralization, um, if we catch it early, we can reverse it. We can remineralize teeth. And so I want parents to ideally start brushing or an oral hygiene routine as soon as teeth erupt. You can even start wiping the gums before your baby's teeth come in with a little cloth or they make xylitol wipes. You can wipe the teeth with xylitol after breastfeeding, um, especially after food's been introduced. Um, sometimes a wipe is easier than a toothbrush, to be honest with you. I have a lot of videos on my website which we can put in the show notes, it's drstacy.com, showing and demonstrating how to lay kids back, how to position them, how to brush and floss. I also have a lot on my Instagram account because I'm a visual person um, and I need to see these things. But, but we want to start a good oral hygiene routine. I would at least do it every single night, ideally twice a day. But if you just find that's too overwhelming, at least at nighttime. So we're removing those food particles and that biofilm from the teeth every day. Um, that's essentially what we're doing with hygiene, oral hygiene. It's removing the biofilm. We don't want it to sit there long enough to leach minerals out of the teeth. The bummer is the biofilm comes back um, as soon as we eat fermentable carbohydrates again, generally. So um, I used to, when my kids were very little, I would just do it on the changing table. I love to lay children back to brush and floss teeth. There's a reason dentists lay patients back. It's not to be torturous. It's so that we can see what we're doing. I can't see what I'm doing if I'm looking directly at you. I need to lay you back and look down into your mouth. Um, don't be afraid to move the lips and the cheeks around so you can see. And my videos do demonstrate that. Um, and so in the top drawer of my changing table, I had diapers, diaper cream, and then toothbrush, toothpaste, flossers right there. So I like to attach new habits and routines with existing routines, right? And so we're always changing diapers every morning, every night putting PJs on. And then, so as the kids get older, you can then lay them back in your lap. You can lay them on a bean bag or in, in a, on the bed or on the couch. Um, I used to love to brush and floss teeth with my young toddlers and kind of older 
um, older kids even in the bedroom. We would do it while we were reading stories. It was part of our nighttime bedroom routine. It doesn't have to be necessarily in the bathroom because the toothpaste I'm going to recommend are safe to swallow and they're safe to use um, outside of the bathroom environment. And many of them you don't want to be rinsing because you're rinsing off all the benefits of your toothpaste if you rinse. So you can do it in the bedroom. Some people think that's not for them. That's okay. I'm just trying to create easy solutions for people. So flossing, if I were to pick one thing that's the most important when your child is probably around two and a half or three, this could be earlier, but as soon as any teeth touch, they can get cavities in between them. And globally, cavities are the number one chronic disease in children. Um, and it's on the rise again. And I, I don't think people really realize how common they are. And it's honestly, in my view, and I have obviously colleagues and friends in this business, we are overwhelmed. I can't keep up with the amount of cavities coming to my office and my friends can't either. Um, and I, I blame our modern diet. I blame the food industry. I blame ultra processed foods. And I blame how we're breathing too, because mouth breathing contributes to cavities as well. So um, flossing, I say this because most cavities, I would say almost 90% in my office are between the teeth. It's not from lack of brushing, it's from lack of flossing. So I think flossing is more important in kids. You know, those food particles get wedged between the teeth, the bacteria come, they just have a total fiesta party and they release acid. And if you're never in there disrupting the biofilm or removing those food particles, it can degrade very quickly. Baby teeth are not as mineralized as adult teeth and they can demineralize very fast. So if you've been doing this oral hygiene routine consistently since you've had a baby, getting a floss stick in your two and a half or three-year-old's mouth, it shouldn't be a huge deal. A lot of times kids get very excited about it. Now, when my kids were little, little, I would like play with floss anyway. I didn't have to be doing it, but I would just have them hold it. I just touch it in their mouth just to desensitize them to say, this is part of our routine too. Now there's two-year-old molars erupt. So it's when the second molars erupt, they come in and they're going to get tight next to the adjacent teeth, just like our teeth are tight in the back. And that's where you need to be flossing, um, ideally every night. And you do the best you can. I mean, even if it's three or four nights a week, hey, that's a whim. Um, but most cavities are between back molars. We can't see those clinically. We only can diagnose those with x-rays. And so by the time a child allows for x-rays, which generally is around four years old, I would say, sometimes three and a half, four, it can be too late. You know, the cavities can be very large at that point. And then we have this young child with these deep cavities that are beyond the point of remineralization. And so we have to do fillings. And a lot of young kids, you know, especially kids under the age of five, they need anesthesia to get their teeth fixed. So this is all about preventative dentistry, preventative medicine, um, and obviously our food matters. And so what I say to parents too, where I know hygiene is so hard in these young kids, this is where we might want to be doubling down and being a little bit more strict with diet, meaning more whole foods, less packaged ultra processed foods. So meat and cheese and nuts and seeds and veggies and fruits and ferments, pickles, olives, seaweed snacks, eggs, things that come more from the earth um, and less things from the middle aisles of the grocery store and, and until we are, we are confident that oral hygiene isn't quite so challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's so much great information in there. I, when you're talking about like um, how you lay them back like my three and a half year old I still like she likes crawling in my lap and I hold her like a baby yeah and she's always done really great with brushing her teeth and they do get excited about the flossing sticks like yeah they get so it's excited. a big kid it's all how a parent presents it you're like guess what the dentist said you can use this just like I do, just like grownups do, just like teenagers do, just like big kids do, right? It's all perspective. With the young kids too, I love that you're laying her back because that can be a bonding moment. You're looking in the eyes. You know, there's kind of like a lot of good hormones being released during this. You can kind of uh, have a loving voice. You can chase animals around their mouth. You can have a little dance party. You can sing a song, make it positive. I, I do feel... A lot of parents, unfortunately, have had negative associations with the dentist or oral hygiene themselves. 
And so, you know, emotional energy is transferable. And so we don't want to put that onto our kids. Our kids' experiences at the dentist can be very, very different than ours, especially if we're taking these more preventative approaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a lot of tra I have traumatic memories at the dentist yeah, as a kid. So many um, people do. I know. And so like my two-year-old, she just turned two like a month ago. Um, she was very slow to get her teeth. At one years old, she had barely one. And so, um, n even now the teeth she has are very spaced out, but right. she, um, she has like, we'll play games cause she's the one that's really hard to get to brush her teeth. Mm -hmm. And so we pretend that there's things in her teeth and we have to like get them out, totally. so, but yep. it's still hard to get it. Cause she doesn't sit long enough. She's, she'll be like, Ariel, I'm like, oh, Ariel's in your teeth. We got to get her out. And then as yeah. soon as we put the toothbrush back in, she's like flounder. And so I'm, she's like constantly trying to talk and I'm yeah. like, Oh, hold on, let me get flounder. You know, like, but we, I, I don't remember. I, it was some Instagram account that I saw that on. So like, I've learned a lot <laughs> as a mom yeah. from like different Instagram accounts. And I'm yeah. like, okay, that's a good idea. Like trying to do this. Cause otherwise I would have had no idea, but I mean the three and a half year olds now, like it's easy for her, super easy for me to brush her teeth. Um, yeah. and she got an electric toothbrush for Christmas. So. Right. I do love electric yeah. toothbrushes. People ask that. So we can start with like the evolution of products. Um, you know, I like the wipes in the beginning. Once, once teeth come in the front teeth, I like little silicone finger mm -hmm. brushes, or you can use the little banana brush, or you can still use wipes. Once molars come in, you can move up to, I would say, a very small headed, soft manual brush, just a regular little brush. And then I would say once all the teeth are in, so usually two and a half or three, that's when I, I suggest moving to an electric toothbrush. And some kids don't take to them right out of the gate. Um, you know, Quip is kind of a nice training wheels toothbrush. It's a silicone brush. It just kind of vibrates. Please don't use it forever because it doesn't do a great job cleaning teeth. I'm going to be very honest about that, but it's more to warm your kids up just to that vibration feeling. I really do like Sonicare kids. That's my preferred one. Yeah. I like that you mentioned the spacing too, because a lot of parents, I hear this a lot. They come in and their, their child might be three or even four. And they're like, yeah, we never floss because they have so much space. The front teeth have space. Look in the back. The molars, I promise you, are touching. It is basically, I mean, I very rarely see it when, when kids have space between their back molars. It is maybe one in 10,000 kids. I mean, it's yeah. really rare. So, and I think part of that reason is parents aren't really looking in their kids' mouths. And it, this is why I like to lay in the back so you can actually see what you're doing. Put on a headlamp. I mean, maybe you don't do this every night, but... It, a lot can go sideways real fast in the mouth. So you want to be checking it out. You might see ulcers. You might see, you can see nutritional deficiencies in the mouth. Um, you can see candida in the mouth. You know, there's just a lot that tells us about the health of our bodies in our mouth. So we do want to be checking our children's mouths. Would candida kind of present as just kind of like a white coat on your tongue? Mm -hmm, usually. And here's what's very <laughs> interesting about yeah. candida. Um. There's a lot of research that shows that candida can create um, the cavity process. So we know strep mutans, streptococcus mutans is the main bacterial culprit, but candida can contribute to, they either work together and become like these synergistic superheroes and they really, I mean, teeth can just erode so fast or there's some studies to show it's candida alone. So when you have these little babies, I mean, I see one-year-olds with rampant decay and the moms have been shamed and told by their dentist, it's your breast milk. You did this, you know, your child now needs anesthesia because of your breast milk. It's not the breast milk. They've been inoculated with strep mutans. We usually don't, we're not born with strep mutans. We get it from someone in the family. So a caregiver, or a sibling. So this is why I very much emphasize, and we can talk about this more, but during pregnancy, even before both partners, you need to up your oral hygiene game, go to the dentist, get your mouth healthy because you can transmit and you will oral bacteria to your baby. Um, so that's how kids first get inoculated, but also kids, babies get candida. So moms have, you know, they get thrush or, you know, moms have candida on their breasts, their nipples. And and it's just not fully resolved. And then you add, again, you add in food, you add in fermentable carbohydrates, hygiene, hygiene's not optimal. So now you have these pathogens in the mouth 
Um, and the other thing I'm seeing um, in a great frequency, I'm actually putting together a lecture on this because it's becoming a, a silent epidemic and many people are talking about it is under mineralized teeth. Mm -hmm. And so baby teeth actually start be forming in utero around weeks 12 to 17. Um, and so, you know, we know generally as a species, we're becoming pretty nu nutritionally deficient. We're vitamin D deficient. We're trace mineral deficient or magnesium deficient. All of these things that we're deficient in are critical for dental formation and jaw and skeletal formation. And so really making sure as a pregnant mom, you're supporting yourself, you're taking as, you know, working with your physician, but taking a D3K2 supplement, taking high quality fish oil or trying to get these through food sources, but that's really, really hard for many people. I mean, I think that's a very utopian, perfect world situation. And I don't think it's feasible for many humans, but vitamin D deficiency in pregnancy really can create mineral deficient baby teeth. And so now you have a baby who maybe has candida, who has fermentable carbohydrates, hygiene's hard because they hate it. And they have essentially less mineralized teeth and it's a perfect storm. And it's really becoming a major concern of mine, the, the under mineralization of teeth that I'm seeing. So this is where supporting yourself in pregnancy is so important. Mm -hmm. And like that root cause that you were talking about before, like everything, it's not just your kid ate a bunch of candy and now they have cavities. No. Like there's underlying health issues mm -hmm. that, that happen. Um, and it, how would like maybe Anna, would antibiotics potentially play a role in that? 100%. Like, yeah. Because when you were saying like younger and I'm, I was thinking, well, a lot of kids in their first year of life end up getting put on antibiotics for different reasons. And that yes. can disrupt the microbiome mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Or moms are in antibiotics during, during delivery for various reasons. So Yes, antibiotic exposure. So you're you're correct. It's not only mineral nutritional deficiencies. It can be also stress. Um, but it can be, um, antibiotic exposure. It can be high fevers. It can be environmental exposures that we're not even quite sure about. We do know there's studies now showing microplastics are endocrine disruptors, as we know, and hormones are needed for enamel formation. Amelogenesis is hormone driven. And so microplastics are now being attributed to affecting enamel formation in teeth, which this gets very overwhelming because what do you do? I mean, what right, do you yeah. do about that? Um, but what you do is you do your best. You just try to not drink out of plastic water bottles. You try to not put, put your food in plastic containers and, and filter your water and, you know, we just do the best we can, but, um, and this is where the proper products matter. So, you know, I think again, perfect world, utopian society, people will say, oh, you don't even need to brush your teeth. You don't need toothpaste. This is not realistic. Okay. So, um, we are fighting against big food. We're fighting against allergies and asthma and airway issues and chronic mouth breathing. And, um, we're, we're fighting against oral microbiome imbalances and gut microbiome imbalances that are, we're just seeing epigenetically. And so we do need products that can help remineralize our teeth for us and kind of and create more balance, you know, because a lot of us are imbalanced. And this is where you'll hear about fluoride. And that is not something that I advocate for. I have concerns with fluoride. And we, I don't even know if you want to get into that per se, your audience may already be on board. You can hear me talk about it more on my platforms, but um, I'm a big advocate of hydroxyapatite products because they're biomimetic and it's what our enamel is made out of, um, and which is calcium and phosphorus. And the studies are incredible. Um, and aside from studies, I have clinical experience. So I've been using hydroxyapatite products in my office almost for a decade. It's almost been a decade. And I will tell you the kids who are using them, they are healthier and with some of the newer technologies, the nano hydroxyapatites that are out there, they're, I'm, I'm avoiding so many fillings. I'm avoiding so many anesthesia visits. I mean, this stuff really does work with remineralizing, reversing, reversing and arresting cavities. It's pretty cool. And we know that even conventional dentistry is getting on board because the ADA um, approved a CDT insurance code at the beginning of the year, January 1st, 2024. So this is brand new. 
um, approving hydroxyapatite varnish. So as a fluoride varnish substitute in the office, and they would absolutely not be doing that unless they felt that it did have scientifically backed benefits. Um, mm -hmm. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So the only toothpaste my girls have ever used has been that. So um, even with like my husband, so I mean, it's just, it's hard to find a good dentist. I'm just going to like say that because he no, went to a dentist like two years ago and they were like, you have nine cavities. And he's like, there's no way. Yeah. And we finally found like a functional dentist and he needs one filling. So it's like, I, I know it's I'm like, going to <laughs> apologize. This is a safe space. I'm going to apologize on the behalf of all my colleagues. Cause I agree with you. I agree with you. Dentistry deserves it's bad reputation. I mean, here's an example I, I deal with. So I had a second opinion yesterday of a three-year-old. The mom was in tears because she went somewhere and they're a Medicaid family and she was going to pay out of pocket to see me, but I ended up doing the exam for free because she was so upset and I, I was so mad. So they were told her child needs anesthesia he needs all four of his front teeth extracted and he needed eight crowns, all his molars. Now this happens. This does. I have cases like this. So I am expecting to look into the child's mouth and it to be a total disaster. I look at the x-rays. I hadn't looked in the child's mouth. I looked at the x-rays. They're perfect teeth. I don't even see an incipiency, which is a small cavity. I see nothing on the x-rays. So I look at my assistant and I whisper, are these the right x-rays? I thought they put up the wrong x-rays for a different child. And he shook his head. He's like, no. And I look in the child's mouth. The kid's mouth is perfectly healthy. Now, I'm not trying to create distrust among my colleagues, but I have to say this publicly because I keep seeing it, especially in the Medicaid doctors, the Medicaid community, please get second opinions. The fastest thing a doctor can do is to that's the most monetarily beneficial is to put a child under anesthesia, extract their four front teeth and do eight crowns. That takes about 30 minutes and they get reimbursed very high, highly for that. So again, I'm not trying to create fear or distrust, but I do see it enough that I have to publicly say this. If you have a dentist you trust, that is amazing. Stick with them. But if you get that little bit of inkling like this mom did that said, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. Please trust your instincts and go get a second opinion. And like with your husband, go get a second opinion. It's okay to get a second opinion um, because you will see 10 dentists and you might literally get 10 different treatment plans. I'm extremely conservative. I avoid doing a filling at all costs. There are other dentists that they can't wait to do a filling. Um, and that's a whole other conversation. So yeah. But anyway, the whole point of all this, though, is the best dentistry is no dentistry, right? I want it to be so you don't even need a dentist. Now, of course, I want you to go because you do need cleanings and checkups. And as we get older, we need oral cancer screenings and all of these things. But the point is, you should walk in and out of your dentist. You should walk in, get your teeth clean. They come check. They high five you. They're like, you look great. And you're out. That's what you want. That's what you want. So, and that's where all this root cause approach and prevention comes in. And, and I will tell you the biggest things, it's not hygiene. It's really diet. It's diet is number one. And then how you're breathing. Um, you want to be a nasal breather. If you are a chronic mouth breather, you're going to have a very hard time to have a healthy, healthy mouth. You just are. So you need to work with an airway trained dentist. We can put links and show notes to some resources there. Um, but most functional dentists have airway training too, I will say. And I can even, I'll give you some ways to find functional dentists as well. Mm -hmm. There aren't very many pediatric, I will say, um, but we're working on that. I think, you know, it, it, this is all such a slow movement, but I, I'm seeing the younger generations. They're really excited about practicing differently. They get it much more than, you know, me and the older generation. So Anywho, it took me a while to kind of sort all this out. Um, yeah, but education matters, prevention matters, get your diet cleaned up and then hygiene's like, eh. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, it's so hard to like know this information because 
most dentists aren't out there. And then also I feel like just like in any industry, like as a doula, when I have a client that brings something to their OB's attention and then the OB is like, I'm the freaking doctor. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, but I can read research. You know that, right? Like I can still educate myself and like, are you up to date with the research? Is this yeah. actually what ACOG is saying? Cause it's not. And so, and then I, I think some of that can happen like in the dentistry world too, For because, sure. um, you know, I did write down the big F word fluoride. Yeah. Um, it's, I was just going to say fluoride is the big one. I mean, Right. I will tell you again, I have a lot of friends that are dentists. I, I lecture, I'm out in the community, I'm around dentists and I'm not only around functional dentists. And I will tell you, most dentists have not read any fluoride research, none. I was guilty of it too. I like to be very honest. I'm embarrassed by this, but I, I think transparency is important. About 15 years ago, so I live in Portland, Oregon. That's where I practice also. We are an unfluoridated community. Um, yay. Okay. Thank goodness. They, it just won't pass. And I'm so happy. But 15 years ago, I was still in residency and it was up for vote again. It hasn't been up for vote, vote since then. And I was on the pro fluoride ticket. I was out picketing and had my fluoride pin and this, that, and the other, and was really advocating for it to be voted and to pass because of my education. It literally is kind of brainwashed into us and ingrained in us. And I embarrassingly never questioned it. I never cracked a research journal to say, is this true? But what about, like, are there other things I should know about? I just didn't. I just took what my professors told me and other people I trusted in the community who, who were in the dental industry and said, yeah, it's the greatest public you know, public healthcare initiative of our century and all these like marketing things that they say. But what changed my mind is one of my faculty members came in, I remember we were eating lunch and he had listened to the debate, which would, had happened downtown. And he was very pro fluoride. And he walked in, he go, he sat down and he said, my gosh, I've never heard the other side's arguments before. I don't, I didn't even know what they were talking about. Neurotoxin thyroid disruption. Like I, I had never heard of that. I need to go read about some of the stuff. And I heard him say that. And I was like, what are you talking about? So then I, that's when I started my, my re-education. So even as a doctor, we have to educate ourselves. We're, we're not getting all the information in our, in our education institutions. And I will tell you, most dentists have not read the fluoride research. They haven't. Um, I, I know that for a fact because I asked them. They don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't even know that there's a, a federal trial happening right now. So there's a federal lawsuit. It's the People versus the EPA. It's out of San Francisco. They just had all their testimonials and everything. I think it was in January. It was fairly recently. And the judge should be ruling any day. It's a federal trial to get fluoride taken out of our water in the United States the, I listened to every minute of it. I've been following it for four years. And if you just go into it without knowing anything, you're like, wow, fluoride's terrible. Why are you doing that? There, they, there are no safety studies. There are a lot of concerns with it impacting IQ, neurotoxicity, thyroid disruption, all of these things. And, and the thing is the burden of proof should be on the safety of something. We shouldn't have to prove it's not safe. And that's right. where the tides have been turned. The dentists are saying, prove to me it, it, it isn't safe. It should be the opposite. So like fluoride prescriptions, the drops that the everyone's prescribing, the pediatricians are, those are not FDA approved. They're not FDA approved. Fluoride is not approved by the FDA as a cavity um, prevention measure. It's, it's approved for desensitizing. So there's just all this nuance to it, right? And so I just think if we have questions about this, especially in young children with developing bodies and brains, it's best to err on the side of caution or at least take a pause. I mean, what most people don't realize is most of the, the developed world is not fluoridated. Only 3% of Europe is currently fluoridated. Most countries have removed it from their water but not the United States, you know, we have right. to make this, this big thing. I had a dad come in from Switzerland and he just couldn't, he was like, what is wrong with you guys? This was removed from our water 10 years ago. There was no debate, zero. 
And the other issue too, if you just want to take away all the health concerns, it's a medical ethical issue. So we're mass medicating people without their consent. And unfortunately, the people it's impacting the most are low socioeconomic um, communities because they can't afford bottled water or fancy water filters. And they're the most vulnerable and susceptible already to other issues. Um, and so it's it's a big concern. So I, for sure, if you want to follow along on my Instagram, the minute that judge rules, I will be announcing his ruling. I'm not getting too excited because, again, it's very political, too. I mean, his, this ruling is very powerful. It's coincidentally his last trial before he retires. Um, you know, I would not be surprised if he has some bodyguards around him. I mean, it's a big yes deal it's a big deal so we'll see what he how he rules and you know precedents have been set set in other countries but not in our own um that being said you know i if you want to use fluoride you know fluoride does make teeth more acid resistant that's great it works topically it does not need to be ingested systemically right. you don't need to be drinking it or swallowing it you don't need prescriptions just use a little bit of toothpaste on the teeth and ideally spit, you know, I wouldn't use it till your kids are spitting. Um, but there's better options now, which are hydroxyapatite. And, you know, there's nano hydroxyapatite, there's micro hydroxyapatite. I don't know how into this you want to get. I really find nano hydroxyapatite is what is needed to arrest, reverse and um, heal cavities. The micro is more for prevention. Some people, um, there's been some misinformation quite honestly about nanoparticles they're all not made the same nano hydroxyapatite was approved for safety by the sccs in europe but it has to be of a certain quality which yes of course we want quality materials just like you want quality supplements just you like you want quality all things we need approvals right and so there is a nano that has been approved for safety and um it's been around since the 1970s and the clinical efficacy is incredible um, and I see, again, I see amazing results. I wouldn't be touting this if I didn't see great results. It's so much so that Dr. Mark Berhenna and I, who he has the Ask the Dentist platform, we were consultants and we were working for some of these toothpaste brands and they weren't listening to us because so many toothpaste, even the cleaner natural ones, they still have ingredients in them that are disruptive to our oral microbiome. So we know that we've been over disinfecting the hand sanitizers, the bleach, like all of this, it's destroying our microbiome. The 99.9% .9 germs killed approved by dentists. That messaging is awful. So yeah. we want to be nourishing our microbes, not killing them. We want to crowd out the pathogens by feeding the good bacteria. And so Mark and I, Dr. Berhana and I, we were so frustrated that even these other cleaner products they weren't listening to us the consultant saying hey you got to take this out you got to take this out so he and I we joked one day we're like why don't we just create our own toothpaste and we have we finally did we actually did and so we have a toothpaste that our whole premise is oral microbiome supportive so we have prebiotic fibers we have clinically proven amino acids in there to reduce biofilm we've taken out all the emulsifiers the surfactants the essential oils because those are very stripping to the bacteria in your mouth and it's it's very clean and it's called FIG. It's F-Y-G-G, -G, which stands for feed your good guys. Cause we're trying to teach everyone through our branding about the importance of the oral microbiome because it influences other systems in our body too. So that is what I recommend, but full disclosure, obviously I'm biased because it's a product I created. But that being said, you just want to look for Hydroxyapatite, I would argue nano hydroxyapatite, and people can reach out to me and message because some are some are not using the right type of articles that um, you know they are sourcing them from manufacturing um, locations like China and other places where we don't know what their manufacturing practices are like. I'm worried about heavy metals and you know all of that type of stuff. So anyway, just so that people are aware. Yeah. Like, so like you wouldn't know this unless you're listening to this podcast or like following your account. Cause nobody is right. like saying that. So like, right. My understanding of fluoride was that it does help prevent cavities orally, but it's not, but it like causes other things internally because yeah. it's not meant to be ingested. So it's mm -hmm. not meant to be in our water. It's not meant to, um, be in our bodies. And one thing that I remind people of like in pregnancy is that 
there's been zero amount of fluoride has been proven safe in pregnancy. And 100%. I'm yes. like, <laughs> This. Please do not <laughs> consume fluoride if you're pregnant and don't in your young children either. Um, this study that came out, if people want to listen to it, the journal uh, JAMA, Pediatrics, J-A-M-A, the Journal of the American Medical Association, they looked at this, this study that everyone references. It's by um, Rifka Green, and they they followed, I think it was 591 um dyads so mother children pairs out of Canada and they did urinary analysis and you know they had them fill out uh, it was a prospective study they had them fill out um, questionnaires basically what was their fluoride exposure during pregnancy and then they followed those children up until the age of three or four um, and they found an alarming percentage of boys so a statistically statistically significant amount of boys showed lower IQ by five points. Now that maybe doesn't sound like a lot. That's on par with lead. Okay. So, and there are over 60 other studies that show very similar results. So it, excessive exposure in pregnancy and in formative years. So again, the burden of proof should be on the safety. So at the very least, I do not think you should be using it when you're pregnant. You should not be using it in your young children. Um, but what's interesting, so there's this podcast, you can search it. So it's by, it's JAMA Pediatrics, it's only 12 minutes. And the editors, who are these very conventional pediatricians, they kind of break down the study and they scrutinized it and they had their teams look at it and try to rip it apart. And at the end, they said, they laughed and said, you know, gosh, I just assumed fluoride was safe. I never looked at this stuff. After this study, I can no longer recommend fluoride in pregnant women and young children. That's exactly what they said. These are medical doctors, traditionally trained, the editor-in-chief of JAMA Pediatrics. He got slaughtered for saying that, by the way. I'm sure. his colleagues. I'm sure. But it's, it's still up. But you should listen to it. It's a great summary in 12 minutes. But that being said, the Fluoride Action Network is another great resource, but that's who is advocating for this federal trial. Um, I just also feel... We have so much burden already, toxic burden. Like we mentioned microplastics and just these things we can't control. Like this is something we can control. We can control the toothpaste and, and families should be able to control the water that they're drinking. They shouldn't have a right. medication put in their water without their permission. So that's, that's my opinion on that. Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's wild. Um, and like you said, it does just like even the people that it impacts, like I've, I did a lot of work overseas and, um, it's in, they've put it in the water in like the major cities in Africa and in different places and mm -hmm. their teeth are not better. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the thing. That, exactly. So too much fluoride actually makes your teeth more brittle. It makes mm -hmm. them more susceptible to cavities um, it changes the integrity of your enamel crystal too. It changes, it's like a Franken tooth. It totally changes the structure. So while yes, it might make it in lower appropriate doses, more acid resistant. It's also like, well, to your point, what is it doing? What else is it doing? That's the problem with dentists. We're so focused on teeth. We, the mouth connected to the body. There's other things we need to be factoring in. But they are showing now that 60% of teenagers have fluorosis. That's those white mottled spots from too yeah. much fluoride. And I've heard dentists say, I've literally gotten like little social media spats before I knew just to not say anything with other dentists who said, you know, you're doing such a disservice to public health. That's just a cosmetic issue that, you know, who cares for that patient? with these huge white spots on their teeth. And I was like, do you think that it's only affecting their teeth? This is affecting their bone. And what else, you know, mm. how is their thyroid? How is their brain development? It's also not our choice to, to force us on a patient and have them have these anesthetic teeth with spots all over them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like the God complex thing that's happening. It really, really irks me. Um, but anyway, floor, dental fluorosis is, it's rampant. You know, we're just yeah. getting too much of it. The thing is too, people don't realize, yes, it's in toothpaste. It's in the varnish you get at the office. It's in our water, but it's in pharmaceuticals. It's in a lot of pharmaceuticals, especially um, 
uh, mood, mood stabilizers and things of that nature. Um, it's in our processed foods, it's in juices, it's, it's in any food that is made in a facility that uses fluoridated water. These big factories, they're not filtering their water. Mm -hmm. So it's in soups. It's in, you know, I never in, thought about that ever. Yeah. It's ever. in food. It's also, you know, it naturally incurs at very, very low doses in food. I wouldn't worry natural food. I wouldn't worry about that. It's so trace. You can't, I wouldn't even stress, but it's in a lot of tea, green tea. I mean, I, I drink green tea. I'm, I'm going to keep drinking green tea, but I don't need any more fluoride than that. You know what I mean? That's all I need. Um, so we're not calibrating or calculating how much people are exposed to. And a young one-year-old, obviously based on weight, needs a lot less of a dose to be efficacious than a 200-pound man. And that's what we're not factoring in when we fluoridate water. Mm -hmm. you, you might drink one glass of water a day, and I might drink two gallons because I'm marathon training or something. I'm getting way too much fluoride. And that's just from my water. That's just my water. That's not all these other sources. Yeah, that's wild. I didn't even think about that. Um, one thing that I want to talk about, and for people listening, I'm I'm taking notes. So I'm going to include a lot of this in the show notes. So if you're like, wait, what was that podcast? What was this thing? Um, I want to talk about, so growing up, the big thing was got milk, right? Mm. Got milk, strong bones and teeth. How true is that? Is like, does drinking milk like really make our teeth strong? Well, I mean, calcium, I, I think of milk as a superfood. I really do. Now, some people can't tolerate it. And I do think we've destroyed our milk uh, quality mm -hmm. <laughs> by over-processing it. And this is a very controversial conversation, but, you know, I would just, I'll just say, trying to find the cleanest, least processed milk that you can, that you feel comfortable with. So whether that's a grass-fed, grass-finished, organic A2 milk, if you're into raw dairy, go for it. Don't say, I told you to do it. You have to make your own decisions. But I do think of dairy products, if they work for you as a superfood. Um, but again, they don't work for them. And so calcium is, of course, yeah, calcium is very important. And phosphorus is very important for dental and bone development. But we can get them in other ways too. You know, leafy greens and kind of nuts and seeds and and um, different various seafoods and things of that nature too. So, But you do want to make sure you're getting adequate calcium. And I don't necessarily love calcium supplements in kids um, unless they're really having failure to thrive and and they really have a limited diet. And that's where I, I would want you working with your pediatrician or your physician because, you know, you can get too much calcium too. Um, and d vitamin D3, K2, magnesium, you know, all of these things work together with calcium to make sure calcium ends up in the right place. So especially K2 deficiency, K2 is like the traffic cop that kind of tells calcium where to go. And if we're K2 deficient, which most of us are, because we're not eating foods high in K2 in modern society, um, we can have calcium end up in places it shouldn't be, like in our, you know, venous, i uh, sorry, in our arterial system, in our blood, blood system, cardiovascular system, but also in our saliva. So if you're really prone to a lot of tartar or calculus that build up on your teeth, it could be that you're K2 deficient because your calcium isn't going into your teeth and bones like it should be. It's, it's hanging out in your saliva and your blood too much. So it's just something to think about too. Mm -hmm. Um, I did find, so I, I order my milk from a farm here, so we do raw milk, but, um, yeah, I did cool. find in a local gro grocery store here, um, that they have a, a milk cause I live out in outside Chicago. So it's, um, I think they ship all over the United States now. I can't think of the brand Kaluna. It's a Wisconsin farm, but they have an ultra low pasteurized, non-homogenized organic oh, cool. milk sold in the stores here, which I think is like a great alternative for people that are like, mm, I don't know about raw milk, but I yeah. don't want to like, I can't you know, even get raw milk in Oregon. It's, it's, you can't get it. It's against legal. the law. Yeah. yeah I mean, illegal. my, someone I know used to buy it in Nevada on the black market. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I mean, that's what I, I have patients, I have patients bring it to me. Don't worry. But <laughs> You do want to be cautious. I mean, you have to trust the farm oh, and for sure. But listen, here's the thing. You see these kids running around farms and they're drinking right out of the cow's udder, you know, like we just 
we, we are overthinking a lot of this processing of our foods, you know, and of course we need safety measures and things, but I think we, there's a way to get back to the basics and still preserve patient safety and consumer safety. And so anyway, yeah, I think there's a, a brand called raw farm. I've seen two out of California, but again, they won't ship to me. So I have to like, you know, drive it over. Smuggle it under the border. Yeah. Which I haven't done, but you know, if anybody That's wants to do so that funny. for me, no, I'm right, joking. Right. Um, but anyway, yeah, I mean, calcium is important. So I think that whole campaign was pretty, uh, intense, uh, <laughs> But I, I, I'm a supporter. I support dairy. I do. Yeah. Um, okay. So two more things on pediatrics that I wanted to talk about quick. One is pacifiers and thumb sucking. So, mm -hmm. um, you can always tell like a kid who's had a pacifier for an extended period of time. Is that like affecting their development or like when to take it away? I mean, obviously pacifiers are easier to take away than your thumb. <laughs> yes. So, um, sure. like, how do we navigate that as mm -hmm. moms with our kids with like maybe trying to get them to soothe a different way? Um, mm -hmm. and when does that need to be taken away before like mm -hmm. causing oral development mm -hmm. change? Great question. Um, I'm going to give you the textbook answer and then we'll talk about like real life momming. Okay. So on um, the textbook answer is I like to see it gone between eight months and a year old. So after that, that like primitive sucking reflex has dissipated. Um, but that can be really hard. So that's like perfect answer. I mean, the generally most will say around one. Um, so the problem is and I often can tell across a room, I'm not even exaggerating, if a child has been on a pacifier or thumb too long, I will say it right away. The minute I look in the mouth, at barely one second glance, I'll say, does your child have a habit? And the parents will like kind of like bow their head like, yeah, they're still on the pass. I can just tell instantly. And here's why. It changes. It's not the teeth. I think a lot of parents think, oh, it's just pushing the teeth out. It's not. It's the skeletal development. It's the shape of the palate. It's the shape of the, the mid face. It's the shape of the premaxilla. Um, and it also, when you put a pacifier in your mouth, it pushes your tongue down. So your tongue should be up all the time. Your tongue should be up, up, up at the roof of your mouth. That's how we breathe through our nose. That's the proper resting posture. So when your pacifier is pushing your tongue down, you develop low muscle tone and kind of a bad habit. And you also, it can also affect you know, this low tone can affect speech, how we swallow, how we chew, and ultimately our airway. But all hope is not lost. So the sooner we take it away, the sooner things can course correct. Now, around the age of one, emotional attachment kicks in, which is why I say really try to have it gone by the age of one. My first daughter, I think I had it gone by the age of 14 months. And my second daughter was more like 17 months. So I get it. You have to find that window where they're not teething, where you're not traveling, you're not moving. But I would say as close to one as you possibly can, because it will get harder and harder. And the more they suck on it and the longer it can cause more damage. So pass fryer and thumb, it all has to do with intensity, duration, and frequency. So how hard are they sucking on it? How often and for how long? Now, I hear this all the time and any pediatric dentist out there will kind of smile and nod. Very often parents, because I think there, there's some shame around it and there shouldn't be, please, no shame because we're all just trying to survive and sleep and function. But very often parents will come in, well, they only use it at night to sleep and then it falls out or they only use it at night to sleep and I take it right out. I find that um, that might be true, but I bet they're getting it and sucking on it more than you realize because a lot of these kids are still kind of imbalanced when I see them. So strategies are cold turkey. Just take it away. That really does work well in the young eight-month-old, nine-month-old, year-olds. You can do cold turkey. The longer you wait, you're going to have to get you know, a little more creative. You can trim the nipple back every few days. That just makes it less satisfying. So it's more like graduated extinction. Um, Frida Baby has a pacifier 
um, set that where the nipple gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So you can purchase that. I think it's like $20 at Target or Amazon. Um, there is a product I like to do a little switcheroo with, especially if you're starting to see oral motor dysfunction or growth imbalances, and that's called a Myo Munchie. Mm -hmm. So you kind of swap it out. It's a silicone bite guard. Um, I like to call it kind of a pre-orthodontic tool. They don't market it that way. It's not going to have profound expansion effects or anything like that, but it can satisfy that that neural feedback loop that your child needs to have something in their mouth. Um, but it can reshape the jaws a little bit and close that bite and kind of shift things around back, ideally to more how they should be. Plus it's strengthening muscles too. And so you can try to find providers that that offer Myo Munchies um, or even Myo Chew is another brand. Um, when kids are a little bit older, so if they're like two and a half or three, three and a half, I mean, you're probably looking at orthodontics at this point. Um, at some point to correct what's been done, not necessarily, but probably. Um, but that's where the pacifier fairy can come. So you make this big elaborate story and and take um the past, you know, leave the pacifier or the leave a note for the fairy. She leaves something really special. So for the older kids, those stories, that imagination type of situation can work well. Um yeah, but then we want to know too, like I, when I find a child's prolonged thumb sucking or pacifier use, it can be a habit for sure. But a lot of times I think is there been a missed tongue tie. Mm -hmm. And that's because when our tongue is resting up at the roof of the mouth, as it should, there's a bundle of nerve fibers up there. And so our, you know, we get vagus nerve stimulation. It's very relaxing, but also dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, like hormones are released that just can be calming, soothing. And so if your tongue can't get up there, think of your tongue almost like a kickstand. When it's up at the roof of your mouth, you really feel more balanced and secure. When your tongue's laying low and flapping around, a lot of those kids, they feel a little imbalanced. So they need something in their midline to make them feel solid and secure. So that is the first thing I think about is like, I wonder if the child has a missed tongue tie and, and I'd say you know 60 70 percent of the time they do or they have some sort of oral motor dysfunction so this is where working with a dentist who has a little more airway training might help too but again don't stress I just want people to be aware of this um and people this is one of the conversations there's two conversations that get real heated with parents quickly and one is pacifier and taking it away early and one is goldfish crackers um <laughs> So, you know, don't hate the messenger. I'm just sharing what I see clinically and you make your choices for your family as you deem fit. Yeah. Well, in motherhood, I just feel like, I mean, there's a lot of guilt and shame and, um, and it, it's on you. It's not on the other person. And I see that like on Instagram a lot. Like I, I recently had somebody write me this message about stuff that I share and how like basically saying that I made her feel bad. And I'm like, all I'm sharing are is research yeah. and facts and statistics. I'm yeah. like, I've never once said, because you made this choice, yeah. you're a bad mom. You know, yeah. I'm saying, here's the research on Pitocin. Here's the research yeah. on this. I, like, I'm sure I, I get it. I, I, I hear you and see you. Cause I get it yeah. too. When well, I hear and things that trigger me too. And it's my own, it's my own stuff. It's not, it's not, that person 100 you know. percent. and then I, what i do is i just choose to swipe through or ignore it don't take it in it's we, you know when i'm writing a post and you're the same i'm not thinking how can i upset as many people no. as possible no i'm trying i'm really trying to prevent disease and i want to improve the health of humans because i think our species is challenged right now and i'm worried about our trajectory i mean that's the god's honest truth yeah. so i'm just trying to share information and you pick what works and you throw away what doesn't work and and um you know and i'm always sorry if i offend people it's never my intention and there's if you think if you could take the time to come see me and know me you know there's like zero judgment whatsoever but it's hard on it's like a text message it's hard to interpret the tone and the the meaning behind a social media post. But um, I will say, since we're kind of on the subject, my biggest concern right now is just mental health. And 
anxiety and fear. And I just, I feel like it's increasing um, a bit and maybe it's social media, maybe it's just media, the state of the world, but you, you really do. I, I don't think there's anything more damaging than stress and mental health issues. And especially, you know, as parents, as mamas, like we are holding down the fort. So you've got to take care of yourself. And if you're finding posts or information is making you feel anxious or sick to your stomach or nervous or frantic or rabbit holing, maybe it's best that you just look past that, you know, because again, it's, it's the cumulative effect of all these things. It's not just one little micro detail, like, well, what, what ingredient did she say? Where does that have to be sourced from? It's probably fine. Everybody's going to be fine. You know, it's the, it's the big things. It's, it's community, it's hydration, it's sleep, it's laughter, it's quality food. Like they'll just go for the basics, you know, and, and all the other stuff can be extra credit if you can handle it. And I think some people really get too overwhelmed with it. And so that's where I've told my husband, like, I'm just going to start watching like dog and cat videos. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I've had to unfollow a lot, like in the last year with everything going on in the world. I'm like, I can't watch this because I just cry every day. So that's cool. Um, So yeah, yeah, I think protecting your peace is really, really big. Um, You touched on, I said, I had two more things to talk about. The other one was oral ties. I was going to mention that Um, all three of my kids have had to have releases and none of them would take pacifiers. So I wonder when you mentioned like, have you know the that maybe they feel off um that kind yeah. of doesn't make sense to my me. it's interesting you said that so I that is true a lot of kids with ties I kind of was simplifying the conversation but a lot of kids with ties they won't take past fires my daughter wouldn't either but they they do the thumb um some will still take ties but I think it's just hard to cup the tongue with a tie to hold a pacifier in there so they they just get spit out, but they can figure out how to keep their thumb in there. So it's just something I think about is just oral habits and ties. But yeah, I mean, oral ties, that's, that could be a whole other podcast for sure. But I have some information on my website on it. There's a really great book called Sleep Wrecked Kids. It's by Sharon Moore. And so for families that are concerned with their children's airway, how they're breathing, any of this stuff, ties, all of it, it's a really great book. It's written for parents. And there's um, sheets and tracking measurements and just things that you can do to honestly become an expert and advocate for your child with their airway health. Because unfortunately, this too is another area where you you just know like there's something wrong. They're, they're, they sound like Darth Vader every night and they're waking up exhausted. And now I'm seeing behavioral issues. And I never saw that before. You know, listen to those parenting instincts. You know your child better than anyone But unfortunately, so many providers do poo-poo it. They're like, yeah, it's normal. Yeah, they'll outgrow it. Yeah, I've heard, you know, I hear it all day long. And they hear it all day long because there's an epidemic of airway issues in humans. Um, So Sleep Wreck Kids is great. And if you're interested even more about airway, maybe for yourself, Breath by James Nestor. If you read those two books, you will know so much about airway. And they're very interesting too. And, And then once you learn this stuff, you will never be able to go to a mall or an airport or an amusement park the same way because you will look around and realize oh, how totally. many people have um, breathing, right. breathing issues. I can like look at certain people and you just know that they're mouth breathers. Like you just mm-hmm. know, <laughs> I'm like that person's a mouth breather for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or you or can even hear like- them breathing next to you. You shouldn't hear br- breathing. It should be mm-hmm. silent. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah. Super interesting. So my, we recently found the biological dentist and, um, my husband, sometimes he'll sleep with his mouth open and I always like push his, I always shut it for him. You should um, lip tape to have him lift. He won't do it. I have it in the drawer. He finds you it. You know really what? Weird. Okay. My husband wouldn't either for years and years. I've been talking about this stuff for years and he heard one darn podcaster who yep. knows who it was, some dude. And he lip tapes now. So Isn't that so annoying? That's so, so annoying. I even said that to my husband the other day about something. I'm like, you won't listen to me on this, but wait until the podcast you listen to has like yep. a topic on it. Then you'll be like, oh, maybe I should do this thing. And I'm like, uh, yeah, whatever, I know. dude. I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. And so my annoying. husband too, it's it changed his life. He, he admits, he's like, I'm an idiot. 
you told me I feel great. He, I literally feel like he's reverse aging. I see inflammation leaving his body. Like he wakes up so rested. He doesn't have to take afternoon naps anymore. Hmm. I was like, your life could have been like this years ago, man. But right. I'm anyway. going to play this clip for him then. Yes. Um, and, because... and there's a cooler lip tape. Well, the branding does not resonate with everyone, but some men like it better because it sticks to facial hair better. It's called hostage tape. I know, I know, I know. But they were marketing <laughs> to men and like the Joe Rogan crowd. And like, I just encourage everyone to get past that. But the lip tape is wonderful. And men like it because it's black and it's more masculine and blah, 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 blah. But it actually sticks to, mm. to stubble and facial hair too. So yeah, you know, yeah. Know. All right. I'll have to get him on that because I'll do that for him. But that dentist actually told him that he has a tongue tie. So uh, um, it was like super interested. And he needs Invisalign on his bottom teeth because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it, you know, it changes how your mouth develops. So totally. um, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so before we wrap up, I just wanted to touch on one thing for pregnancy. Um, so I am crazy about oral health. Like I am an avid, I stopped like using mouthwash years ago. Right. Um, I'm an avid, like I floss every single night. If I don't, I feel weird. <laughs> like I'm like, Same. Uh. It's gross. I know. <laughs> so, I know. um, I floss every night. I brush my teeth, obviously like morning and night I tongue scrape. Good. Um, and awesome. I'm just like, I, I don't know how people don't do it. Like it just, I'm just very big mm -hmm. on oral health. As soon as I get pregnant, my gums start to bleed. And like, I recently had a dental appointment and it went great. Like I have no cavities. I, um, they even tested like the pH of my mouth and yeah, did good. all this stuff. And I had perfect balance, like everything they tested, right. was it nitrogen in your mouth? They tested yeah. that. And she mm -hmm. said, I've never seen these optimal levels before. And I was just like glowing. I'm like, I'm so amazing with my nitric, oral health. It's nitric, <laughs> nitric oxide levels. Yeah. Okay, it's yeah. really, really hard to be optimal in nitric oxide. So I was, go. so yeah. I was so proud of myself. Right. Um, I do have a different issue, which we won't get into on here, but as soon as I get pregnant, I start bleeding. So, yeah, yeah. um, common, right. So like how to talk to us really quick about the importance of oral health in pregnancy. Yeah. Why we, why flossing slate saves lives <laughs> and, yes, um, it does. and like 100%. anything else that we can do, I guess, in pregnancy to really, cause that's where you do hear the stories of like, I never had a cavity till pregnancy. Mm -hmm. I was got pregnant and my tooth fell out. Like yeah. what the heck? Yeah. So yes, just another fun thing about being a woman. Um, so estrogen and progesterone, obviously these hormones are all over the place and that leads to gum inflammation. It's called pregnancy gingivitis. Sometimes you can get pregnancy quote unquote tumors, which are pyogenic granulomas. They're benign, but they will be like gross on the gums. I mean, it's just absolute chaos. There, unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do except be meticulous with your oral hygiene and floss and brush. And I recommend going to the dentist more frequently during pregnancy. We've been made to fear the dentist during pregnancy. That messaging needs to stop right as of today. You need to go more. You go every three months for a cleaning, um, every two months. Um, but you're right. I mean, periodontal pathogens, there have been studies to show like they can read to pre preeclampsia, preterm labor, negative pregnancy outcomes. So you don't, you really want to make sure you're healthy. Now, sometimes you can be doing all of this and you'll still have gum inflammation and bleeding gums. And that's because of your shifting and changing hormones. Now that usually will go away after you deliver and maybe a few months into your breastfeeding journey or whatever, however you choose to um, navigate feeding your baby. Um, but also just supporting yourself. So gum health is really based on vitamin C levels and collagen and proteins and B vitamins and um, zinc. Those things are very important for gum health. So, you know, taking a really high quality prenatal, um, making sure you're getting enough vitamin C. So, you know, scurvy that mm -hmm. was affecting the gums, right? So vitamin C deficiency, it, it may not make it go away, but we just want to keep the underlying structure very optimal. As we know, we're going through these hormonal shifts. Now the teeth getting loose or losing a tooth, that's due to relaxing. So you have a little ligament around your tooth, the periodontal ligament, and relaxing will affect that too. And a lot of females notice their teeth shift and move or become loose 
as they get closer to delivery, when the relaxant is increasing to get them ready for, for, for birth. And, and so. And there's nothing you can do about that. Nothing you can do. Oh I mean, just being careful, I guess, like making sure you're seeing the dentist hygiene. Yeah. It's hard. I'm yeah. It's just hard. I mean, this is where just being all trying to be as optimally healthy going into a pregnancy as you can. And then hopefully some of these things that happen, they're just less extreme. Um, but you know, a lot of this is genetic predispositions to things too. So, um, just being very meticulous as you are, I mean, I, and flossing is important water picking, you know, you could water pick too. Um, some people can't during pregnancy, they just can't get their hands in their mouth. They can't tongue scrape. They're so nauseous and sensitive, but maybe a water pick might be a better solution for you. If you're very nauseous, if you vomit a lot, like trying to do baking soda rinses, um, I would, I would use a nano hydroxyapatite toothpaste or some sort of remineralizing, um, definitely not fluoride. Um, just because, you know, this is up for debate and it shouldn't be, but like you do, we give minerals to our babies. We are giving yeah. them everything. <laughs> And so if you're not optimal, if you're already a little deficient, now your baby's right. taking all of these things from you, you might lose minerals in your teeth and be more susceptible to cavities. So this is where you just want to try to get as optimal as possible. Or as soon as you find out you're pregnant, like double down on, okay, I'm going to like get on some really high quality supplements. I'm going to work with somebody that can really guide me on this path of just keeping myself really nourished. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have one last question. Um, because I think that there's debate about the order of doing things. So like yeah, yeah. some people wake up and eat breakfast, then brush their teeth. Some mm -hmm. people brush and then floss. Um, what is the optimal order mm -hmm. of doing these things? This is one of those things that I don't want you stressing about. Okay. This is one of those rabbit. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Just do it. Oh, I'm an oral health, health perfectionist. So. Do, well, okay. So this is this is never there's no data. Okay. On this. So okay. this is what I think, and I have talked to like Dr. Berhenna about this. We get this question a lot. Um, because we are humans love to be, we like instruction manuals, so we want to be told what to do. I'm the same way. So I do very much like flossing, then brushing. Okay. So if you're gonna do that, when when I first get up, I tongue scrape. Um, and then I usually floss and brush. Um, sometimes I will oil pull after I tongue scrape. I only do that a few times a week, but I don't brush after breakfast because honestly, I kind of eat a little bit later. I'm not like total intermittent fasty crazy, but I don't eat right in the first couple hours I wake up. And then I usually eat all pro like a really high protein breakfast. So I'm not really eating any carbohydrates. So, because I want blood sugar stability. So I don't have any carbohydrates in my mouth. So I don't feel like I need to brush after breakfast per se, but I will rinse usually. Um, if you like to brush after you eat, I totally get it. Um, you wanna wait 30 minutes. So um, every time we eat, our mouth becomes more acidic. And so our enamel does lose a little integrity. It loses a little, it becomes a little weak after you eat. It's part of the digestive process. It's the, the acid breaks our food down, gets us ready to prime the pump down into the, into the gut. Um, so if you brush right away, you could be damaging. Those bristles could be damaging your enamel. So you want to allow the enzymes and the minerals in your saliva and the calcium and the phosphorus to naturally raise the pH again. And that can take about 30 minutes or so. And this is the same after vomiting. I mean, I know everybody wants to brush your teeth right away. You really shouldn't. You should just rinse maybe with water or baking soda or a little salt. Um, so the order doesn't matter too much. Do just what works for you. But I will say, I do think flossing before brushing makes the most sense. That That is the one thing I I like people to remove the biofilm in between the teeth, get the food out and then kind of, brush it away that way so but again it doesn't matter I just want people flossing I mean yeah that to me is the biggest hurdle so. mm -hmm. right right awesome well I just want to thank you so much for coming on I'll include everything in the show notes um your Instagram where everybody can find you um and then the different links that we talked about as well awesome thank you yes. so much this was really fun I appreciate it yeah thank you again for coming on